Hello, and welcome to the KCP community meeting, October 26th, 2021. Um, we have some items on the agenda. I think many carried over from last week. Uh, the discussion last week was very good and thorough and wide ranging, uh, but I forgot to mention a very exciting topic that was near the end of the agenda, uh, which is welcome Andy. Uh, Andy Goldstein is here and has joined our uh, KCP team at Red Hat. Um, I assume you've prepared a speech. I assume you've prepared perhaps in song form. I'm not sure <laughs> you said you were- Song and to... dance, yes. No. <laughs> um, thanks, Jason. Uh, nice to meet everybody that I haven't met before. I'm NCDC on GitHub. I've been involved in OpenShift and Kubernetes for a while now uh, at Red Hat and Heptio and VMware, worked on um, Kubernetes proper and Valero for backup and recovery and cluster API. So um, I've, I've kind of been around to lots of different avenues and KCP is really exciting to me. I'm super happy to be back at Red Hat working on this. So um, please reach out if you want to chat and um, looking forward to getting to know this community. Great. It's, uh, it's, it's good to have you. It's, good. it's nice to have more people who know where all the bodies are buried to help us bury some more. Um, that was sort of morbid. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, uh, last week, we did a lot of discussion about the two-phase transformation and syncing uh, concept. And I'm not sure if we ever like finished it or just ran out of time. But that being said, I think... Um, David is not here. David's on PTO this week, and I think uh, uh, Clayton is not here yet. So I think we might just put that off or discuss it offline sometime uh, rather than um, try to have that conversation without them. Um, last week, we also had uh, some impromptu discussions about sharding, and we've actually had some conversations even earlier today about sharding. I don't know if we want to... I feel like we need to document this better, but I don't know that it makes sense to document it now while it's still so relatively in flux or it feels sort of in flux. I don't know if, if Steve, you feel the same about the flux fluxitude of current sharding ideas, but um, I feel like this is going to be a really important aspect of like if KCP is a minimal API server, it doesn't even matter for multi-cluster stuff. It's, it's literally just if it's going to be a performant, scalable, resilient API server for anything, uh, sharding is going to play a big part of that. Um, and so, yeah, do, do uh, I don't know if we want to go over some of the recent discussions, current blockers, like stuff that we're thinking about. Yeah, I think the, the biggest areas of focus and conversation in the last two weeks have been, so Andy and Stefan had Ask the, the the why question, um, like what's the point of a shard? And so I think there's like a mostly finished doc that tries to put all of the conversation that happened answering the why into words. Um, and then that helped us sort of like narrow down into some specific uh, client flows and use cases that like require a sharded API or I require a sharded API to be exposed under under one um, endpoint versus being able to you know do some sort of client side stuff. I don't know that we're. I mean, I think we should just make that document public. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Clayton says he's about to do that. And then the other one is I was digging into like. Okay, now we have like a minimal endpoint. Like, what does this actually look like to use, and what are the implications? And that's like very much still in flux. Um, but I think, I don't know, my biggest takeaways right now are you, you can't do this in a transparent way that would completely make all previous clients work because you need to start enforcing the opaqueness of a resource version, which I'm sure will break some people, even in the case where you're just talking about one logical cluster because that logical cluster can jump around shards. Yeah. Um, and then if you're multi-cluster or multi-shard, I think you need to be explicit about where you're routing your stuff. And so that obviously needs changes. So the, the 
the uh, real core underlying issue is that in order to well our current approach for making sharding work is to uh is to exploit the opacity of resource version strings like assuming people assuming clients don't try to derive any useful information from that we can put whatever we want in it and we can derive important information we can have our shards derive important routing information from that um I believe that resource versions are already supposed to be considered opaque. If users, if clients aren't considering them opaque and are trying to, you know, they just happen to be like auto incrementing numbers. And so you can, if, you can derive the, information from them, even though you shouldn't. It It's the, we told people they were opaque and then, mm. you know, it, given a large enough user base, someone will, will not read the docs because who reads docs as a developer? And also, people needed things that the auto incrementing integer provided yeah. that there was no formal solution for in Cube. And so we did the classic, you know, well, this is probably okay, but don't don't do what we say, not what we do. Right. Um, and so it, now at this point, uh, the risk is we don't understand the scope of what it means in the client space. This some of the implications of this are call, called out in the consistent list watchdoc, like. You need these properties. Um, we've come up with a few examples in Cube where we need things that are similar to it. Um, we're still kind of just exploring. And, and roughly like sharding implies if you have multiple things, you need to build a consistent history. We're kind of exploring right now. This is was like this is the discussion that prompted is like we're basically weighing two options, which is to try to do hard sharding or just make it somebody else's problem what are all the trade-offs because we know that our scale dimension is larger than a single etcd yeah and so do we give up the guarantees that etcd gives us and implement those in another system like another system effectively means a database that can provide those semantics that offers some of the other trade-offs like you know you could say if you replace etcd with postgres you lose all the etcd operational characteristics but you gain a scale characteristic but then you still need to go do a sharding or geographic mechanism we've kind of set as an axiom we need a geographic mechanism and so either we're implementing it or we're delegating and the delegating constraints so here it's yeah it's what are the client semantics we need to deal with sharding getting it all written down is a very useful exercise because nobody we haven't really tackled it in cube um, and this is maybe as far as i know this is like there's a few people who've touched on it in various different dimensions this is like we're actually trying to write it all down in one spot this is like this is what sharding cube would look like um whether it's yeah. single cluster sharding or global geo sharding of the same concepts so um as, uh, i had assumed and i believe and it sounds like i am correct in my assumption that there is some document somewhere that's a, a, a public like Kubernetes document that says resource version is supposed to be considered opaque. It's on the, in, pra in it's practice, on the it happens off. to be an incrementing integer, and people depend on that because of Hiram's law. Because yeah, it's like explicitly called out in the docs. And, and we put that in. We actually even it's even further scoped. It's within a namespace, and it's weird because we don't like we say this is considered opaque and it only meaningful within a namespace, but then we didn't actually define what that meant for yeah. um, within a kind namespace and cluster we didn't actually define what that meant basically um dan smith uh daniel smith and and i and a couple other folks in the early days we were just like let's bound it so that we can go and i think beta had a way in on this is like very early on like first six months of cube we're like hey let's put some boundaries in case we want to shard mm -hmm. and break the problem up um eventually we did different back-end storage for events because at the time events were high write rate mm -hmm. uh then eventually we were like oh we added extending api so we added both crds which use the same etcd and then aggregated api servers which we were kind of started with the assumption that people were going to use different etcds but then operationally that turned out to be such a giant disaster for a cluster operator that in practice all the all the aggregated apis that i'd ever want to support would use the underlying etcd of the api server so that doesn't help you right rate and then we basically said hey everybody should just control the right rate so we had a priority and fairness yeah. and so here we are seven years later and we don't really like people do exploit the property of it in a few cases 
there's a few problems in Cube that are unsolved today, like restoring from an Etsy backup. Controllers do not automatically detect and resynchronize when they experience a state reversion. There's no easy way to do that except detecting from a changed object that, like, oh, you know, like this object went back on generation because generation is an integer. Uh, generation doesn't cover the full object. And then resource version, if you can't compare resource version, you have no, you know, you have no idea. So again, um, you know, people have tried to think through workarounds. I feel like this is all stuff that should show up in the docs as like a guarantees that controllers clients expect. Um, but we haven't done the, we, we probably have a work item that should go under there, which is like canvas the ecosystem. Like someone should go spend time digging through the ecosystem. Who abuses this? I did a quick pass through Cube last night, and some of the places where we were using it has been removed, but I didn't have time to chase down. So there's a canvas of who is using it that we suspect that it's somewhere between zero and one percent. And being a cynic, I'd say it's probably one percent of clients depend on integral resource versions. Um, there was yeah. an effort about two years ago to make them opaque, which we stopped because uh, we were already hitting problems in our own code base, and it was we were making them opaque without really understanding what properties we would need. So that's kind of the current yeah. state of resource version is. The, um, Jordan and I ran through a couple of examples that we could find in Cube, and all of them were, if I remember, like down in Cube somewhere that didn't really apply to QP. In with Cube, the current you say? Yeah. Yeah, and so I went and reviewed some of those because I needed to physically change it, and those, some of those were actually wrong in the sense of we were trying to do something that might be better solved a different way. Um, one of them was like, comparing a cache in like the kubelet has a cache when you make a change there was a theory early on that we would use right through caches in controllers which the kubelet's a controller where we'd be like hey we'll make the change record it in our own cache and then you know we're waiting to see but you can't do that without being able to compare an incoming event to an object you just changed and so a few of the places using it in the kubelet that i'm aware of that may be different than the ones you were thinking about, Steve, were actually wrong. And no one's really gone explore that. I had like a, it's on my list of, oh, this is a cap that needs to get written up, but I hadn't gotten any further on it. There's also a bunch of uses in like, there's like that version or interface that like tries to span the gap between opaque and integer. And I did an audit and it looked like almost all of those cases were just comparing the parsed resource version to zero to see if the object was inset, which... And we did change the informer to compare zero as a string because we defined zero on the request side as having a specific meaning. So we actually formalized it. And we said, if you pass the string zero, um, then the end result is that we ignore all caches and then we violate one of the consistency guarantees that Kubelet actually needs. So that's the that's the bug I referenced where... Right. But I think I think it's like much less than it and clients. I guess they're probably using it for generation, but um, I do think it's interesting that you mentioned that it was supposed to be opaque, or sorry, it was supposed to be comparable within a namespace. Um, it was, this is too early for us to understand all the use cases. We were just right. trying to, uh, we, we knew that we would eventually want to consider sharding, and so we were leaving ourselves room to maneuver, but then we didn't actually do anything to defend ourselves. And in the meantime, we abused it elsewhere because it was convenient, and we didn't do a cap that said, let's clarify this because Everybody was like, ah, caps are hard. We'll just fix this. Well, by I think behavior. The, the interesting part of that statement, because um, also to be clear, like the documentation is written today, it doesn't make that distinction, right? Does it um, say namespace? No, but I, yeah. <clears throat> um, I think that's like basically the conversation we were having yesterday, which is if we don't enforce some sort of total order between events, between different shards, or I guess moving back one step. So like the client that as the client that's going to benefit the most from a sharded list watch is the type of client that's trying to do some sort of aggregate computation across like multiple like data that's you know in multiple cities um and i think we brought up quota as like one of these examples and so in any like multi-writer context without having an ordering between items that are in different cds you know you can imagine like two quota controllers making different decisions about who gets accepted or who doesn't based on the series of events that they observe um, but Stefan pointed out yesterday that this is sort of analogous to there's like an unbounded delay in the controller caches 
-hmm. And you could still have incorrect actions based on stale cache data. Mm -hmm. um, so whether or not you're admitting That's very common, a... actually. M most people don't actually test their controllers with real latency. And so the moment they actually get to a point where they have real latency, they find subtle race conditions that don't show up. Like until you get to about 100 milliseconds or 150 milliseconds of latency, most people's controllers don't. It's uncommon to hit that, but when it does, like every controller I have ever seen that's trying to do anything, there's just some subtle ordering. So, well, and I guess like um, I think where I was going is like this idea of resource versions being utilized within a namespace. So we have an analog, like we have an analogous implication on shards that you really can't expect any sort of comparison or ordering between shards, or really between workspaces because workspaces can move around. Um, and so I think that's like a generalization of that namespace concept. And I think it's probably worth it to do an investigation of like how many controllers today really fall apart when you don't have a consistent ordering between like sort of independent or unrelated events. Um, or are most people building controllers that have like slowly but eventually convergent behavior like quota? Because if they're doing that, then it doesn't really matter that we're only providing a partial order. Quota is one that I wanted to like set aside for a second because the way we implemented quota in Cube was we were like, well, at the time etcd didn't have transactions. And so we chose to build an on top system that may not be the best design for quota because it actually, it, it, it was a lot of work to get to the point where it kind of worked. And it's not a generalizable system for like true database quota. Every true quota system usually gets closer to the data store because there's certain guarantees that like you can't provide the way that it's implemented today um, or much much harder so that that's one i wanted to separate like quota is kind of a fundamental property of a database usually as is like ingress control or admission control in the sense that most databases use Admission control is all about making sure that you have hard boundaries on how many resources you consume so that it's not trivially easy to blow up a server. Cube never did that because, again, we said mostly single admin. Um, if you've had, a, like, we didn't have a lot of extension in the early days. And so it was all the use cases brought by Cube. Now we're getting to the point where priority fairness is real, but like going back and reassessing it. So setting a side quota, I suspect there aren't many total ordering, but I agree a canvas would be useful. And even in a basic, even in some basic exploration, most ordering problems basically boil down to it's better when you give up on ordering as a client and don't try to order events and converge. The few specific problems in the space that we know of that have ordering typically come down to dealing with other properties. So the doc's trying to capture those, um, those variants. So, um, Stepping back, the, like fundamentally, we will need to uh, uh, walk back all these clients that have been deriving semantic information from the resource version, because we are going to completely break them when we when we make them opaque again, or when we make them like useful to us but opaque to uh, end users. Right. So, so we need we should lay groundwork for that. Assuming that will take a long like time that, to walk back. Like two types of clients like that. Typically, they're controllers. Mm -hmm. The expectation would be most controllers should work unmodified. If you say that like we want most controllers to work unmodified and most clients to work unmodified, we do have the escape patch, which is, is this less than 5% of controllers that are like this? We're still within our 95% error budget for client compatibility. I suspect just based on what we know today, if it's not required in client go and our existing controllers work and we don't believe that property is any worse than existing cube like um backup or whatever like restoring from backup then i would probably say we're already in the we're still 95 percent compatible what would be our recommendation for them when they have a prop like we're trying to anticipate the problem that they'll have that we may need to solve and the implications because today we are Everybody gets total ordering, so you don't know who's dependent on it. Mm. The worry would be more things are relying on total ordering will break them. People who are using resource version to compare 
have explicitly gone the extra step to call out why they're doing it. So if we canvas them, we may know who's using it and why, yeah. and we can narrow down our, oh, this is a problem that we hadn't thought about. Um, is it easy today for the author of a CRG to add a generation? I'm sorry, Steve. Is it easy today for the author of a new CRD to add generations? And it is, and it, well, it's easy, but it's hard to get generation right because uh, it involves comparison of the object in a uh, semantic way on spec. Right. Arguably, and this is another thing in Cube, is if we really thought about it, we should have just added an in a spec index or uh, a uh, sorry, a, an overall object index. We were leveraging. We're kind of like we don't have one. We didn't really need a status generation or the overall generation. Um, there's some other problems there with uh, when you compare an object, the property we were going for with cube objects is if you write them and there's no change, you get a, um, you, you don't actually execute the database change. Subtly putting things in the object that change when they're changed can, like you have to reason through that. So I think a CRD author absolutely could. They would just probably hit a lot of the same problems. There is an argument, and I was advancing this with Dan Smith, which was um, maybe we should have an overall generation. Dan's argument was for a lot of the concrete use cases that I was bringing up, that single server apply or uh, server side apply actually handles a bunch of them because server side apply is basically stomp the fields that I own, conflict if I don't own a field or someone else has taken ownership of it, um, it's kind of like blind put. And again, like there's a lot of subtleties in why blind put doesn't work and all that. But um, I, I think it's possible a CRD author could do it today. We would have a recommendation for them. Uh, I guess would we they... expect that like to Jason's point, like if, if we're, you know, having a conversation with someone that wants to use KCP and like, are we expecting that the majority of the use cases for comparing resource versions as it is, is because they didn't want to implement generation? It's possible that I, I, I don't have an anticipation because all the places we used it in Cube were subtle, uh, like the right through cache is the most obvious example of you need to know. And again, like people may have implemented this and not realize that they have an inconsistency. Right, like again, this is why distributed systems are hard. Like, it's really hard to reason about. It's like threat. You thought threads were hard, or you thought uh, locking and mutex was hard as a junior programmer. Like, I remember like being terrified of those. Distributed systems is like once you get the model in your head, it's easy to reason about. How do we get people to get the model in their head? I suspect some of the places right now that people are, um, people are doing things like write through caches, and it's actually just wrong, and they don't notice because it eventually reconciles. To Jason's point. So trying to call out that nuance, which is the advantage of a reconciling stomping controller is that it's a broken clock that you're right 99.9% .9 of the time a day. And that's functionally, there's, that's functionally no different from being correct. So, um, you know, this is like the, we accept the probability that things are broken makes the world a lot easier. Um, so we're, we're basically trading on that in a lot of use cases. So the doc has a couple of these notes. Um, it was extremely useful to have the discussion and I'll get that doc out as soon as possible. It doesn't go into all the implications we're talking here. We should get those documented as well. So this is like kind of our, how do you write controllers summarization what are the problems we believe controller authors face today that aren't covered by cube that we can improve in cube and then if we were to shard it which problems and properties do we need and so it's kind of a we're trying to understand requirements and not break anything or determine whether it's just a gap in cube versus the alternative of we don't try to do sharding we do um, we rely on a data store that scales better than etcd which is a completely different set of problem um, and it was useful to have the discussion because we were presenting this as an exploration and it's weighing two, at least two alternatives right now. Don't try to fundamentally solve sharding, just make that someone else's problem. Deal with the consequences of that, which may be just as expensive, right? Because that's emulating everything that a controller would need. How do we test that we've emulated everything a controller would need globally? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of the stuff you said, uh has raised alarm bells in my head of we should be talking to the point to at the bottom of the thing we should be talking to more folks in the the 
broader Kubernetes ecosystem and other SIGs to get their feedback. Advanced I mean, it sounds right. like you are, like it sounds like we are talking to a lot of people, but like whether it's presenting the, you know, halfway through exploration and the two ideas were uh, juggling or at the end of the exploration, like summarizing that somewhere to some external audience would be super helpful. Cause I think, I mean, probably more helpful if we do it in terms of here's where we are currently thinking we haven't decided because then we can still get feedback. Well, and, and, and not even that, but it's, um, we're trying to kind of do a survey of how controllers are succeeding yeah, and where they are failing. Any place where a controller is failing today is potentially an input, especially if it's a scale dimension, ease of use dimension or consistency. And so it could be that one of the arguments, we, we should be going and reviewing with people writing lots of controllers, the class of problems they hit and then yeah. maybe we make some determinations like, well, if everybody's failing at, at reasoning about distributed cache consistency, maybe that points to a gap that we could say, you know, it's finally worth it. Cube, nobody's come to Cubic API machinery recently and complained about this that I'm aware of, but I absolutely know that what happens usually is someone fixes one subtle problem in their own thing, even in Cube, and they don't pass it along. Yeah. Uh, Andy, you have raised your hand. Thanks. Um, I also think that a lot of these problems are probably not faced by um, some or all of the controller developers out there because at least like with Cluster API, for example, we just said, we know there's going to be some scale limit, like a single cluster that's managing other clusters and machines can only manage so many. We don't know what that number is because we haven't done the, the tests, but Basically, if you hit a limit, just go create another management cluster, and then you manually, like in your head or on a wiki page or something, do the sharding. And so you say, like, if you need this management cluster, you go over here. If you need that management cluster, you go over there. And I think that what we're talking about is we don't want people to have to do that. We want to say, we're going to give you a URL, and you go to that URL, and we can solve the entire problem without you having to maintain that index. And so I think that's like a different class of problem than probably what a lot of controller developers are. It, yeah, you definitely, arguably, yeah. You would, uh, you're, you're talking about like a lot of the mindset for controllers carries over, but it is crossing into an, a new domain that's novel in scale and uh, desire to uh, present a more approachable, like now that like, because in Cube we had no idea whether a controller pattern would actually resonate with Class problems. Cube benefits from the fact that a lot of those problems are closely related. Like, you got a bunch of crap machines. You got a bunch of crap cloud APIs that weren't were eventually consistent. You have a bunch of crap like database providers, a bunch of crap storage providers. It's all just crap. Like, and I mean that in the most loving way possible. Like, everything sucks. The controller reconciler works particularly well at when. The easiest thing to do is just to keep hitting it really hard with a hammer until it shuts up. And when we go to the next level, we may keep some of that, but we may actually start caring more about some of the other properties scale. And um, can someone actually break the problem up into uh, tractable things? Because again, like Andy, I think your point is sharding is the problem of breaking up into co-located failure domains. We've kind of said we're trying to help people. If we're going to bring everything together, we know that you'll want to break them apart. Can we bring can we bring all the people together, but then let them break the problem up? And that's kind of, in a nutshell, a hard problem, but it might be worth solving at this particular time because we are all just doing it via the wiki um, and bash implementation approach and GitOps, right? GitOps is yeah. encoding all of your sharding decisions. Yeah, I think I think you're definitely right to call out that that the scale we're talking about is not the scale that most people ever like ever hit or are hitting currently. And that usually the solution is one more Band-Aid. Uh, and then about the time you have 15 Band-Aids and 25 clusters in your wiki and bash scripts to generate bash scripts, you're like, oh, this is terrible. Uh, I wish I had built this from the start the right way. And it seems like what we're doing is trying to give an idea of how to build it right from, from the start. Uh, even though most users will not need it now, hopefully and they will grow and need it. So Jason, that, that just reminds us that we do need to be can like we need to call out the set of like canvassing that we need to be doing. So there's one for controller problems, controller, how people are using controllers, searching for the 
the constraints that existing cube controllers assume or e examples of problems that uh, with consistency that are just hard to reason about so that controllers in general get more effective. The, the other one is we have a hypothesis that everybody's got 15 band-aids. It's backed by a lot of observational expertise experience. We want to make sure that we have a good system for talking with those consumers and assessing it, which I think the project was intended to be a point of discussion where we could go find people. Um, we've had a few inbound. Um, we probably need to call out as there's an explicit task, which is we need to do a lot more outbound communication with you know, high scale multi-cluster users um, in a number of dimensions. Um, what are the layers that you're building? What are the specific problems you're having? Do any of these solutions appeal to you? Yeah, yeah, I, I think like the the survey of controllers, like this current group can probably name, you know, a few dozen controllers that might have this problem. But the broader the net, the more we'll find and the more use cases we'll find that we need to account for. I think, I guess, uh, uh, my TLDR is we should really summarize and present this summary of this expiration to some group somewhere to get the word out about like, do you know of any other controllers that this will break or that, you know, do, do you know that you have personally written a resource compare resource version comparison function? Uh, you know, amnesty for one day while we, while we fix that. Uh, um, cause I think, I think fundamentally we're going to need to strengthen the language in the docs and even purposefully break the, the functionality early before people come to KCP. Right, like if if there was some flag in in regular Kubernetes to make resource versions non-deterministic and random and uh, break that, then it would it would flush out a lot of these use cases really quickly. Like, oh, my controller broke because I needed that. Uh, well, now you know. Now we've learned that you needed that. Like, come to us and we'll help you fix it, so that you can you know step up into KCP when you need that scale. Um, I don't think the exploration is done but i think the time to present it to folks to get their feedback on it is before it's done right like i don't want to present our our solution to the problem and then find out there are 20 other problems with it yeah and, and we should be able to name like ideally because i think and this is like i suspect going to be a factor that we went away is if you've built those if you've built 12 band-aids you may not be ready to pull any of them off <laughs> um, if you're at 20 band-aids, you're probably like, man, where's all this blood coming from? Um, and so what we're looking for is we want to find people in the spectrum of from five to 20 band-aids and look at what overlap in the problem is and just verify that as well as going and finding some people who are getting to 14 band-aids who'd be invested in, um, you know, switching out some of those band-aids, uh, maybe even looking for areas where we could go like do one or two band-aid kind of removals. Um, and then the twenties yeah. are the ones most incentivized to change, but they may have the most requirements because they may have to solve that problem now. So like we are trying to, we need to assess where people are on that spectrum and come up with some shorthand for, uh, what kind of multi-cluster person are you? One who's flailing, failing, um, uh, concerned, uh, uh, blithely uh, swimming along happily. Um, yeah. And look for places where we uh, can overlap. Uh, Steve's comment was go to SIG API machinery and present the idea uh, to opt into a more opaque RV. I was going to propose that Steve do that exact thing, uh, but instead he beat me to it in the chat. So I so will. What's, uh, the, what's the cap going to say? Like, we need to do this so that we can magically do some things? I think, I, like, I think, I think the, I, I'm, uh, I haven't committed to writing a cap yet. Um, I think we could say like resource versions have always supposed to be, were always supposed to be opaque. Unfortunately, they are not. And people use that. Uh, some, some things inside of Kubernetes use this, like we are, we are ourselves bad, but other controllers, you, uh, came to rely on that behavior. This presents a fundamental like limit on the amount of, it, it, it prevents sharding from being possible, or at least sharding the way we'd like to do it. Um, in order to uh, assess the scope of this problem, like assess the the, the scope of people depending on resource version uh, being transparent to their non-opaque, um, 
and maybe just to get an idea, like uh, to be the first step of a migration path away from uh, uh, meaningful RVs, we could have a flag that that you can enable on your cluster to make them completely opaque, completely random, completely non-comparable. So my only hesitation there is, is that a good enough reason to take up the time of SIG API machinery with a cap? Or is it frame the cap as opaque RV would be helpful in these scenarios, but we're still early in the discovery process. I guess the question is like, what makes it the most important problem? Like writing a cap is effectively taking someone's attention. Yeah. So like. SIG API machinery's default answer to new caps like this would be like, can you convince a couple of people at least that it's worth them paying attention yet? I don't know that it meets that bar yet. I, I think Jason, your basic statement is, yes, that's generally true, but is it hurting us? And can we come up with, are we confident enough that opacity is sufficient? So like for me, yeah. my, my worry would be, do we need to couple the other parts of the problem to it, which are um, you know, uh, time travel detection, yeah. or an approach for backup, which we may or may not. Um, I guess it would be like framing and drafting a cap would be great, but then I think it'd be like, but is the why worth the effort? And if this we go down this path, do we understand the problem enough that we wouldn't back ourselves in? Like if we do opacity without comparability, do we need to know whether comparability there? Just for yeah. drafting the cap and saying like, hey, we would like opacity. We think we might want comparability. Here's five examples of controllers that need comparability, and here's the problems. That may not be fully required to start the cap, but it might be required to to move the cap to implementable or something. Yeah, so it's fine to start the process. It's just I I don't know what where I feel like we're a little bit. I feel like that process of going and figuring out does anyone need comparability was kind of what we were talking about with canvas the community kept starting a cap and finding participants is one way starting a, a draft cap as a google doc and trying to find uh going into the sig API machinery going to the controller communities is kind of what you were saying before that may be just as effective i wasn't i'm not yeah. trying to neg on the going and writing a cap i'm just trying to Does, like doesn't this also impact like other backends other than that CD? It impacts Kind, but I don't know how serious Kind is for anybody except for K3S right now. So every K3S user who's implicitly using Kind is probably okay. I haven't seen serious large scale use. So asking um, asking Kind community, like going and searching through Kind community, finding who's using it, like Alibaba, I think had some large scale stuff. Someone needs to do an assessment of Kind ultimately for the other branch of the strategy tree for sharding. Um, in just a quick glance, it's being used, and there are still some gotchas. Like, um, I'm not, they're not, I saw some concerning things about being not convinced that compaction was implemented correctly. And so then that gets more into the if you don't implement compaction correctly, you have some very, very, very serious problems. Um, there's also like performance evaluation, all that. So getting more familiar with kind absolutely useful because branch two of the shard tree at least calls that out as a we have to go explore it and then they would probably know is anybody um you know using this in anger yeah so um it sounds like a real actual cap is probably heavier weight than we need at least for now but it will a draft, a, a draft cap will at least get people's attention and at least get people's feedback which is really survey the community we are looking for people using these problems. Yep. Yeah. And, and I'm, I am not trying to say, don't go talk to SIG APM machinery. Uh, I don't know, Stefan's other call. Like I, I'm always like in SIG APM machinery, like it's a whole bunch of people who like have been like in this for seven years and they're just like tired and like everything's yeah. hard. So like we're barely able to get like, I haven't gone and gotten the limit stuff to GA. It took us like two years to get like the table formatter to GA. Yeah. after we implemented and delivered it. So it's definitely a, it, it operates on glacial time spans because there's a lot of key problems that any problem really has to be urgent or someone has to really commit to long-term. I think we're kind of saying we're committing long-term to getting this movement in place, um, but we need yeah. to we need to provide the, the motivating force and be like, hey, don't panic. Or, you know, we're, we're looking for people who are going through these problems. Here's where it touches. Being able to articulate that, that's awesome. Yeah, I think I think it will be uh, a difficult balance between, like, I also I don't want to uh, show up in two years with a fully formed design saying this is all the stuff we're going to do to you, but I never also do don't that. want to never do that with a cap. Yeah, 
yeah, I also don't want to bug them every other month with another like tiny tweak toward the direction we think we're going. Like, like it's a tough balance between you know and over communicating. I've tested a few of these ideas with Daniel, but it's been like you know, like uh, we've brought this up a couple times over the last couple of years. Jordan and I have chatted about like resource version and guarantees. We're all just busy people dancing around each other's yeah. like the the slices of attention. Pulling it together and making a coherent case for it, Steve, I think is a great like starting to like pull it together and going and fetching the water and chopping the wood um, is always appreciated. I think, Don't be surprised I think if David's like, ah, I think this is a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we could like I think we could frame it in terms of it's time to start thinking about sharding. Like we it sounds like sharding has been on on their mind for you know from the beginning, but never really urgently or soon. And now we're yeah. talking about like Google, it's time to start thinking about it. What would we need to do it? As far as I know, Google is deploying with events stored in a separate etcd. OpenShift has never done that because it was like mm -hmm. operational complexity was too high. We just said fix right rate of events. So mm -hmm. Derek went and did a lot of the event throttling with priority and fairness. Like we've got some controls on right rate. But yeah, like uh, Joe Betts um, definitely has been dealing with you know, Joe Betts has always kind of had that concern about the etcd as a store does not have an effective admission mechanism. One of the trade-offs between option one and option two is if we need an effective quota and admission thing, there are systems in modern databases that are like, it takes a good couple of years to develop, like, you know, it's probably like five, 10 person years of work to develop a good admission and quota system in a database. Etcd doesn't have it. Don't see it happening soon. That's another factor, which is like maybe we could make a justification for ourselves to to invest more in kind and mm. to go then close out those problems. Um, so yeah, Steve, that's that's a perfect succinct summary of the two options. There might be a third option. No, I haven't heard it suggested yet. Option three is kind of implicitly a data store that can't be sharded, which I would say that doesn't offer significant benefits to option over option one, because then we would be solving two problems, make that data store consistent with NCD, and then also implement sharding. And like the tests and others don't offer enough guarantees. Um, but so the two, the two statements then are uh, sharding the problem space. That's the bigger one. That's like how large scale deployers, like how are you hitting those band-aid problems? The smaller one is the controller patterns and problems. Andy and Steve are gonna chase that. Andy, Andy's gonna gather input from Twitter and Steve will put pull together some docs and gather from and work with API or at least mention API machinery and, and take it in the community. Cool. Yeah. Um I'll, I'll note these. I'm taking notes. Yeah, I mean the 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 problem of of corralling API machinery's uh, collective attention and or corralling it and managing it and not over oversubscribing it, paired with the idea that some folks are already just doing this in kind. I wonder if that's if we're not thinking about that enough yet. Like, it's going to be harder to get KCP to shard in terms of talking to multiple etcds i'm saying it like a statement when in fact i made it as a question will it be harder to get kcp to shard across multiple etcds than it will be to have just keep like keep investing more in a shardable actual storage engine and and we're trying to say like we want to solve sharding and failure domain store is a failure domain backup incrementality is mm -hmm. a failure domain um is that important enough so that's like a I got a few of that copied in the, uh, this was like some of the questions it was like, what is our, what is it important enough to allow someone to be like, yeah, of course I want to run, I'm going to run a, a control plane. It, like, this is like the broader one control plane can fail. So then you add more control planes that are locally resilient. Like you run edge devices that like running a single node cube is effectively running a distributed control plane. So, it's a bigger scale problem. Is there something in between where you have like kind of a broad set of control plane that's kind of like generic, and then you have more specific is that clusters, and then do you have even other types of control plane problems that are relevant, or 
is there value in just trying to get to two layers and be like, you got clusters and a higher level and that's it. And if you use this, it simplifies all your other problems is having to have a shardable data store that inherently is shardable a net benefit to that or a net negative um, weighing those factors. I think we just, we're still trying to kind of clarify the problem. Um, and this is where like researching it within users would be uh, going and doing some of the broader review will help. Yeah. Uh, and even aside from talking to other groups, which we can do now, soon, anytime on Twitter, you can respond to Andy's tweet right now. Um, uh, I think this is also a really interesting topic to propose a talk for at KubeCon next year in Valencia, which leads me to my other point that the CFP for that is open now and closes December 15th. So if you are, if you, meaning uh, you, Steve, or you, Andy, or you, Clayton, or anyone else who's following this and interested in presenting it, is interested in presenting it, then I think this would be a really good thing to propose because I think it, it sort of, uh, it has two goals. One is uh, look at how smart we are, look at all the stuff we've thought of, and uh, a lightning rod for this will break me in a way that you, know, you haven't thought of. Uh, so I feel like uh, having a... Uh, public declaration of this conversation will be useful both for advancing the state of the art in what we all think of this and also getting people to to throw pies and in throwing their pies tell us what we're doing wrong in a useful way um i don't know if that is at all interesting or or enticing to you steve or andy or anybody or me or maybe i'll do it but um i think this is an interesting topic and i think we should share it Call for okay. I also added a third one, which would be like maybe this is like another thought, but I don't know who's done the does like there's kind of a general problem of like and I was trying as I was going through this, I was like, what are all the design patterns for controllers? Like we have some record of like how to write good controllers. Are we doing enough? Can we review with the people who are kind of driving that in the ecosystem? You got controller SDK or controller runtime, um, operator SDK. Uh, Red Hat's operator enablement teams, um, a review of the space, right? Like St Andy, you know, knowing where all the bodies are buried in a set of controllers. Um, you know, early on, um, Brian and uh, Brian and Brandon, or Brendan and um, and Dan and Tim, I think, did the paper um, that was like the controller pattern in Kubernetes. Um, it's been six, seven years, and like it really deserves a, a rehash. So there's maybe like a broader, if anybody's done this or is doing something adjacent to this, can we go and assess where they are? Um, and if not, maybe we should seed an effort in one of the groups to like, you know, are we doing a good enough job of boiling controller design patterns down into actionable code, documentation, yeah. and experience? Because even qualifying that then helps us say, like, well, which of the problems are just harder to solve? Yeah, I know that, like, when when I started writing controllers, there was a an absolute, like, lack of documentation of best practices. Mm -hmm. There, like, there were some talks and some blog posts and some, like, little little nuggets buried out there. But but um, it's it's a lot of lore and cargo culting and, you know, copying some snippet that you that you see from some other place, like. It is not a, a, a well-defined practice. Uh, I think we want controllers to be the rails of distributed systems for the purposes of uh, managing the crap we have. Uh, yeah. If that's not achievable, um, we should know. There's uh, there's a lot to do to make it as good as uh, to make it as good as that. Um, and we have the experience now, like we're seven years in, like, you know, Rails came about six years into, you know, web, you know, small consulting teams building uh data-driven app enterprise uh, what we would have called um the two-tier app or three-tier app at the time um you know building that and just like kind of being able to stamp them out um kind of what the value of a like the band-aids you know discussion is if we get enough of the band-aids all at once we can um potentially help you know medium to large size organizations do this and then we could provide integrators ways of because we're trying to get at that, like, hey, it should just be easier to build and deploy and orchestrate all this other crap. Like infrastructure of code has had its chance. Configuration management has had its chance. There's a test theory here that um, for the things that they don't do well, can we complement them by taking a large class of the problem out of 
Like how many people need to build an integration with AWS to orchestrate AWS cloud resources for the purposes of deploying applications? Um, how many need to do that for cloud functions? How many need to do that for on-premise environments, et cetera? That motivation um, should be, is controllers the pattern or is controllers not the pattern or is it a part of the larger pattern? Like is it controllers plus uh, ad hoc automation plus bash scripts plus, you know, uh, a bunch of config files and GitOps, you know, like the, uh, there's, we shouldn't discount the possibility that it's not the framework for building these distributed systems, things that makes integration easier. So that's the, uh, that's a separate thread, but it's a sub thread. Yeah. Um, so just going back through the chat. Um, yeah, uh, Steve, I'm not sure, as Steve said, I'm not sure what end state finished product would necessarily, would be necessary to actually create a cohesive, interesting presentation. Uh, I don't think we have to. Uh, I don't think we have to present. Here is the final finished solution that we came up with to so like you know the journey of like ha experienced a problem, thought about it, solved it. I think it's like experiencing a problem, thinking about it. Here's one possibility? Question mark. Like it, you know, it doesn't. Uh, I definitely don't want to present it as we have solved the problem of distributed applications because, I mean, unless we have, unless we have by December, in which case, you know, that'd be great. Let's do that instead. But um, just like advancing the state of the art of like, here's the problem we're having. Here's here's how we think, here's the problem we think you're having. Like, this isn't us. We think you you are having this uh, and we can uh, we can help you with it. All we have to do is Price uh, semantically useful resource versions out of your cold dead hands and make controller writing easier and shard stuff and you know easy stuff like that. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think that would be I, I would find it to be a compelling talk to listen to uh, and um, maybe even a compelling talk to give. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know if there's anything else anybody uh, is is uh is burning to talk about uh we've taken up again most of the time with this discussion but i think it was a, a useful one and a good one um i'm going to take an ai to uh volunteer uh steve and myself to go to sig api machinery and talk about this problem whether or not that's in terms of a draft cap or in terms of a like here's the thing we're thinking about help us think about it better um i think i think it's becoming something we can start to present. Like, I think a month ago, this wasn't something we could even like talk about coherently. Um, whether or not we're talking about it coherently now, you know, TBD, but um, yeah. So with, uh, with the last few minutes, if anybody has anything to discuss, if nothing, I'm more than happy to take uh, five minutes before my next thing. Um. Are there any, is there anybody who joined the call who has a topic they didn't feel comfortable putting on the list, but want to bring it up now or call for, uh, I, I kind of, uh, you know, one of the things I was wondering to myself, Jason, is um, are we, uh, we kind of, we run through the topics and it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, very specific topics. Um, maybe one of the things we should do is uh, if people join, um, you know, what they're interested in, if you, if you feel like you don't. You wanna, we might wanna create a space or a few minutes before or after where we kind of go through open topic, probably before. So if anybody on the call has a topic they'd like to bring up, um, uh, please do. And if not, you know, please comment on the issue and we'll talk about it next time. Yeah, that's good feedback. I think I'm also going to take that five minutes at the beginning to not necessarily like go around and, you know, like ask for an icebreaker or anything, but like, why are you here? What are you interested in? What can we talk about? Uh, I noticed that David's not here, um, but I talked to David uh, last week um, around some of the his proposal from last week around um, the uh, transformations and the security boundaries of the sinker. Um, and uh, I had a proposal that I wanted to like, <laughs> I went on PTS, so I didn't get a chance to write it up, but wanted if it, we have time. Now, one thing that I was thinking about is adding the ability to um, store diffs. Um, so you would have your primary object, you'd have a set of diffs, diffs for the under 
lying cluster um, as like a resource. And then when the cluster sinker would ask for that resource, it would get the primary resource plus the diff and then be able to apply it in a set of sure. like, you would get the security boundary that you were talking about, but it seems like you maybe have thought of that clean <laughs> from so your face. This was actually proposed very, very early on in Cube when we were talking about what eventually became uh, server side apply, which was, um, you know, you have the concept that you have a schema and then different perspectives, different personas have a set of changes that they want to apply to that schema and, you know, to an, a given object that may belong to different people. So we actually, Early on, we discussed something similar, probably not exactly identical of uh, when you create a cube object, could you also go and create diffs alongside it that then get merged together? Um, so we did explore some of those trade offs. So there's we could probably follow up and discuss some of what did or didn't work there. One of the most obvious ones was it was just really complex. And we didn't know whether we wanted that complexity. So like, there is a this was and this was my comment. I don't know if I made it to David last time is like, all clever ideas are worth exploring but the some of the best ideas in cube were like this is so stupid that there's no chance that would actually work that ended up being like because you didn't need a second concept it really reduced the problem space um that was the other one which was like the, that's how we kind of weighted those which was well you know uh we all like we were worried about multiple people editing the same object, but in practice, it didn't matter. Server side apply eventually came up with field ownership, which was like a subset of the problem. And field ownership was enough to make server side apply handle it. Although we're six years in and only a few clients have adopted server side apply. Controllers are just now starting to think about it. So uh, it's kind of an example of like, it was a good idea, but it didn't pass the too much novel complexity. So that would be like another factor we should think about. We shouldn't be afraid of, of generating those ideas. Um, and I can go, I, we can chat offline or um, uh, we'll sub, sub discussion and come back on it. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, I, I kind of thought that I would want to write a proposal or at least get like a little something together just to see what it would look like, but that sounds good. The, the biggest cube lesson, which was in theory, separating parts of data out in an object uh, so that you clearly like, you know, every field could have multiplicity or, you know, even David's suggestion of like having two objects, a private and a public version. Uh, the advantage was, is that that's like the, that's like aiming up here. And what really worked was like the dumber, like it's just an object and we have some basic spec status that's kind of there. And that works for like 99% of problems. Um, Sinker might have special stuff. Like this is the first time that we're talking like cube didn't really go after things that all objects had except for object metadata object metadata is the place where we put things that all objects should have uh certainly knative and the duct typing stuff and the traits discussion all basically boil down to is that a general pattern that we can be okay with or do we actually need to to go up a level and honestly like annotations might be enough is we we actually some of the things that we discussed in cube is annotations were enough for apply for the first five years and yeah sure they have problems but they worked uh, don't be afraid to abuse annotations is kind of one of the lessons i took from early cube um, yeah. until you really know what the general problem looks like so we may not know what the general problem looks like or maybe we do have enough info now that we could make a bet on one of these alternative storage mechanisms yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I have to run to another thing and I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, and we'll talk to you all soon. Stop recording. Thanks, everyone.